as pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist believers worldwide. My love for the church and faithfulness to his word compels me to share some of my concerns. You see, here are four great concerns for the church today. And we could add additional ones, but examine and carefully look at these four. First of all, a loss of Seventh-day Adventist identity among some of our pastors and church members. The growing tide of worldliness in many of our churches, the danger of disunity, and a spiritual complacency and apathy, which leads to a lack of involvement in the mission of the church. This concerns me. Let me address these one at a time and explain what I mean. You see, the lack of identity is such that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is much more than just another denomination. According to Revelation chapter 10, it was born of God out of the disappointment of 1844, just as the New Testament Church was born out of the disappointment of the cross in AD 31. In both instances, the followers of Christ misunderstood prophecy and were bitterly disappointed about those disappointing situations. But out of those disappointments, God providentially raised up a divine movement of destiny to impact the world. According to Revelation 12:17, God's last day people would be characterized by, first of all, keeping God's commandments, and secondly, having the testimony of Jesus, which the angel identifies in Revelation 19, verse 10, as the gift of prophecy. According to Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12, God's end-time church would proclaim the message of the everlasting gospel in the context of the three angels, and the second coming of Christ would be calling every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to worship their Creator by keeping His Sabbath. There is no other religious movement in the world which fits this pattern. There is no other church or denomination that meets the criteria of Revelation 10, Revelation 12, and Revelation 14. Now here is precisely my concern. Too many of our pastors and members either have failed to recognize or have forgotten the divine prophetic calling God has given us as a church. There's a growing tendency to minimize our differences with other denominations. In some Seventh-day Adventist churches, the messages from the pulpit are a little different than the typical Protestant church. Much of this comes from a neutralization of the Bible as God's Word. It is so important that we base our beliefs on the Word of God using the historical biblical method of studying the Scriptures and approaching prophetic understanding from the historicist perspective. God's Word must be foundational to our belief, faith, and practical living. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth if we will study, pray, and listen to God's voice. This will help us strongly establish our Seventh-day Adventist identity. The lack of Adventist identity has even led some to doubt the literal seven-day creation week, denying a worldwide flood and reducing the Sabbath to merely a rest from stress rather than a last day sign of connection with the Creator and Redeemer Himself. There are some who would like to reinterpret the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation to fit a more contemporary mold. They see the historic interpretation of prophecy as a relic of 19th century thinking. I'm reminded of Ellen White's clear statement and quoting, the whole of the gospel is embraced in the third angel's message. And in all our work, the truth is to be presented as it is in Jesus. Let nothing lessen the force of the truth for this time. The third angel's message must do its work of separating from the churches a people who will take their stand on the platform of eternal truth. Our message is a life and death message, 
and we must let it appear as it is, the great power of God. We are to present it in all its telling force. Then the Lord will make it effectual. Coming from manuscript 19 uh, of 1900. You see, we have a life and death message to present to the world. Seventh-day Adventists have been raised up like Noah to prepare the world for its final hours. We've been raised up like John the Baptist to prepare the world for the coming of our Lord. We must never forget who we are and why we are here. We cannot, must not, will not, degenerate into one of hundreds of religious movements with little end-time focus and no clear reason for existence. I am absolutely confident that guided by Jesus Christ and faithful to our prophetic heritage, this Advent movement will triumph at last. I appeal to you with all of my heart, be faithful to the call that God has given you as a Seventh-day Adventist. Embrace this message in its fullness and filled with the Holy Spirit, go out to share it with the world. Now this leads me to my second overwhelming concern. The growing influence of worldliness in our churches is alarming. Jesus stated it well when he prayed, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should Keep them from the evil. In John 17, verse 17. The Apostle John added, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Beautiful verses from 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. The church has always faced the danger of losing its perspective and compromising in loyalty to Christ through a growing tendency to allow the world to shape its thinking. The closer we get to the end of time, the more the devil will redouble his efforts in this area. I'm concerned about the almost overwhelming tide of worldliness that is sweeping into some of our churches. Standards which were once cherished by Seventh-day Adventists in the areas of diet and dress, recreation and amusement, and Sabbath-keeping are fast becoming things of the past. When members are adorned like the world, dress like the world, love the world's entertainment, listen to this world's music and are captivated by its Hollywood productions, genuine spirituality erodes and the devil makes inroads into the soul. When the Adventist health message, which so many honest-hearted people in the world are embracing, is made of none effect or considered to be legalism or fanaticism rather than a glorious gift from a loving creator, something is tragically wrong. Let me just add that in reality, we do not get to heaven by what we eat or by how we uh, perhaps show ourselves to be religious. We have salvation through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. But once Christ comes into our lives and works in us in a powerful way, giving us justification, the same power brings sanctification, which helps us to then have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. You see, we are ambassadors for Christ, as 2 Corinthians 5, 20 says. We are the light of the world, the salt of the earth, as Matthew chapter 5 tells us. Jesus says, Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Millions all over the world are looking for something different from what they have. Deep within, they are tired of the aching longing to satisfy their heart's desires through the things of this world. They long for genuine, authentic Christianity. 
we will never reach them by compromising our standards, heavenly standards, to come down to their level. We must lift up the standard. This is no time to flirt with the devil's dress, diet, amusement, and worldly influences. This is the time to hold the standard high for the world to see. Christ living in our lives and dwelling in our hearts makes a dramatic difference in how we live. And this leads me to another concern, the danger of disunity. In John 17, Jesus prayed for the unity of his church. One of the devil's intentional strategies is to attack this unity. He knows that if the church is not unified, it will not effectively accomplish its mission. With prophetic insight, Ellen White gave us this divinely inspired counsel as follows. Unity is the strength of the church. Satan knows this and he employs his whole force to bring in dissension. He desires to see a lack of harmony among the members of the church of God. Greater attention should be given to the subject of unity. Beautiful quotation from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 159. This statement is extremely insightful on the devil's tactics. It pulls the curtain aside and reveals his strategies. The evil one uses all of his forces to bring in dissension and conflict to neutralize the soul-winning efforts of God's people. This is a time for administrators, pastors, and members to unite in Christ under the banner of his truth to preach his message to the world. God has given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church a divinely inspired church organization and mutual agreements called church policies, which under the guidance of the Holy Spirit are part of what helps to hold us together as a worldwide family. To discard or ignore these mutual agreements violates a sacred trust and creates unnecessary discord. I pray that every one of us will lay aside our personal opinions for the good of the body of Christ and that we will together march forward to the kingdom of God. And here is the last of my major concerns. The increased spiritual apathy and complacency prevalent in many leaders and church members' lives. And I have to include my own. There seems to be a spiritual paralysis in many Adventist members' lives. We have to examine our lives to make sure that God is working in us in a vital way, and I speak to myself as well. Recent surveys indicate that the overwhelming majority of church members believe the doctrinal essentials of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They really do not greatly question the 28 fundamental beliefs, but there is a growing complacency about sharing their faith. There is apathy about witnessing. They believe but are simply not very involved in the mission of the church. They're part of the culture of the uninvolved rather than the culture of the involved. There is no fire in their bones. There's little passion for sharing their faith in Jesus Christ. There's no urgency in their soul. My brothers and sisters, without active involvement in the service of Christ, we will not grow spiritually. The prophet of God could not make it clearer than this when saying, the very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. To neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual feebleness and decay. Where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. What a powerful quotation from Desire of Ages, page 825. Involvement is the answer to apathy. As the prophet of God says, where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. Now, if you want to be spiritually alive, get involved. If you want a vibrant prayer life, get involved. If you want to appreciate the word of God more, get involved. If you want to have a deeper love for others, get involved. If you want to see souls one to Jesus, get involved. If you want to see Jesus come soon, get involved. Join the hundreds of thousands of Seventh-day Adventist leaders and members around the world who are actively involved 
in the mission of the church. God wants to use you and me to proclaim his end time prophetic truth to every corner of the globe and especially the enormous metropolitan centers of the world through mission to the cities, utilizing every form of comprehensive urban evangelism, including comprehensive health ministry and many other methods. The task is great, but God is in control and leading his people. Does the church have challenges? It certainly does. But I see evidence of the Holy Spirit's powerfully moving among his people. I see evidence of the Holy Spirit doing some special, exciting activity right now in his church. I see the evidence of the Holy Spirit preparing a people for the coming of Jesus and our Lord's soon return. Brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, as I appeal to my own heart, to make a full, complete, total consecration to Christ. I appeal to you to embrace the prophetic calling that Jesus has given to this church, his remnant church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, a church that is on the march in the Advent movement. I appeal to you to lift the standard high in your own life. I appeal to, to, to you to become actively involved in witnessing for your Lord as we anticipate Christ's soon second coming. Will you make this commitment right now as we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we come to you at this very moment recognizing that history is meeting at this time in such a dynamic way to show us that prophetic utterances in Daniel and Revelation and the book of Matthew and elsewhere in the Bible are bringing us to a time of decisiveness just before Jesus' coming. And so, Lord, help us to be completely connected with you. Help us to lean upon you every day. Help us in our study of your word, in the study of the spirit of prophecy, in our prayer life. And, Lord, just use all of these wonderful connect connections with you to then help us to share this faith, to become involved in many activities in our local church and around the world, to bring the three angels' messages and the fourth angels' message of Revelation 18 to the forefront and to the minds and the hearts of people all over the world. Lord, I pray your blessing on every church member, young and old, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Be with those who are attending our churches who may not yet be members. Be with those who are interested in the truth of the Bible and help us, Lord, to reach out to everyone through mission to the cities and mission to the rural areas, using every method possible. Lord, send the Holy Spirit upon us. Send the latter rain so that truly we will be part of that last great Advent movement that proclaims this message to bring glory to God throughout the earth. Thank you for hearing us and for the promise of your soon coming. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.